everyone. My name is Jacob Gorski, and I am so glad that you are listening to The Gayest Generation, where we get to hear LGBTQ elders speak for themselves. Their stories make noise where there is silence, and that silence has gone on for far too long. Now, what if who we call the greatest generation also happens to be the gayest? In this episode, we speak with Pat Burkle, who I first met through my mother. Now, I am lucky and blessed enough to have the kind of mother that when I came out as gay, she went to the library, Barnes & Noble, got every book she could about being the parent of a gay child, unlearned all the homophobia she grew up with, saw every movie, read every article, and she started going to P-Flag meetings, which once stood for Parents for Lesbians and Gays, to hear from those in the local LGBTQ community. If it says anything about my mother, she is now the president of that chapter. And when I started to attend meetings with her, I noticed that it wasn't so much parents or families as it was senior citizens coming somewhere to find community. That's where I first met Pat and we got on like a house on fire. And she's here to tell us about working on the line at GM in the 70s, her lifelong friendship with a transgender trailblazer in crossing going to jail off her bucket list. Viewer discretion due to adult language and situations is advised. This is the gayest generation. My name is Pat Burkle. I'm 74 years old and I'm from Vassar, Michigan, and I am a lesbian. I didn't know you were 74, Pat. Huh? You're a spry 74. Well, not lately. I have a. Uh, Back thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're so glad you're here with us today. Um, we all kind of had a moment where we realized, like, hey, I'm attracted to people of the same gender as me. Yes. I want you to talk about that moment when you kind of realized, oh, wait, I'm a lesbian. Okay. Uh, I am considered what, well, what they say, I, I'm a late bloomer. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I was in my 20s before I realized I was a lesbian. Sure. Um, I went to a parochial school and homosexuality was not talked about um, back in the 60s. It wasn't you know, on the news every other day. and mm -hmm. So I always knew I was different, but I really didn't know what it was. They Everybody just called me a tomboy, you know. And uh, so that's, you know, and uh, my parents, you know, hey, the clothes got handed down. I wore my sister's clothes. I wore my brother's clothes. Mm -hmm. And and I was comfortable in them, so I didn't complain, you yeah. know. <laughs> um, so that's uh, I I would say I you know, I was in my twenties before I put a name to it and then sure. knew. When was the first time you heard the word gay or lesbian? Because I think there's that moment where you realize that you're different, and then there's the moment where you realize that being gay is a thing that other people other people are gay too. Well, my relatives are you know they would say jokes or. Uh, you know, when I was younger, and you kind of pick up on that when you're when you're smaller, you know. Oh my gosh! And uh, so you know, you kind of hide it, you know, because oh, I'm different, but I don't know what it is. And then eventually, uh, you know, we we finally did get a TV, and if something like that would come on the TV once in a great while, you know, my father would have a comment or something mm -hmm. about it, and. Uh, so, you know, you just sort of get to the feeling like you shouldn't be talking about this. or Sure. You oh. learn through even the smallest comments. Oh, yeah. Even when I was younger, I think, you know, I didn't know what I was, but sure. uh, it just it just seemed like you don't talk about that, you yeah. know. So. And did you grow up on a farm in Vassar or? No, I grew up in Bridgeport. In Bridgeport. In Bridgeport, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, my parents, my, my mother came from a farm mm -hmm. and my dad worked on a farm, you know, because they had a lot of kids and the teenagers would go out and work on other people's farms, you know, to basically support themselves. Yeah. 
So I've been around farms, you know, my whole life. I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. You told me this wonderful story about when you were in the first grade and your first grade teacher. Mm-hmm. And you were like, go ahead and tell me a little bit about that. Um, I just had a, I mean, I just, I don't, you know, I didn't know what it was. Yeah. But I just had an attraction to her. Mm-hmm. Um, she was a very good teacher. I wish I had had her through my whole eight years. Sure. Uh, but in the parochial school, in, in the one that I went to, every year you jumped in a different room and a different teacher. And, you know, I only had her for that, that one year. Or was it one or two years? I can't remember now. It's been so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, I, I just felt something for her, you know. Mm-hmm. And was it the way she looked, the way she treated you? Uh, or is it, can I you put I, words to that? It's hard to put words yeah. to it. I had this feeling, but, you know, I didn't know how to express it or Mm -hmm. even know what it was. And when you don't have the language or to kind of label something or describe something, what does that feel like? It's frustrating. Yeah. It's very frustrating. Uh, Even today with this younger generation, and they're coming up with all these different terms for Mm. themselves. I, I'm having a hard time understanding what's going on today. Sure. And so you can imagine what it was like for me way back in the 50s, you know, <laughs> uh, to to try to understand it, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, the kids nowadays, they, they have a name for everything. <laughs> <laughs> when the comedi- com- comedians go through their... You know, some of their little acts, and then they say, you know, QT, and they just keep going on with uh, with every uh, letter in the alphabet. You know, it, it, that's about what it's coming to. Sure. <laughs> um, and we had talked about, and I, I know this from my mom as well, that you grew up in the church. Yes. And what did you learn about your sexual identity Coming up in the church at that time? Nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Eight years of religion. Mm-hmm. That's what I had. Um, I didn't even, I don't think I, you know, even heard the word homosexuality um, until I, I probably got to junior high or high school. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's sort of one of the uh, low points in my life. I would still go home to my parents to go to church every Sunday. And uh, the minister had a sermon on homosexuality. And that was one of the last times I went to that church. Mm -hmm. Um, By then I knew what was going on. I don't remember how old I was, but uh, it really turned me off to religion. Sure. Um, I just couldn't believe that he would stand up there and say what he said, considering I had heard rumors in the church about him and other parishioners. Mm -hmm. So that kind of turned me off to religion. And this being one of the first times you've ever heard somebody else talk about homosexuality, and they're talking about it in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. that I was a sinner and, and you know, I was going, you know, basically that's what he said. You know, you're a sinner and you're not going to, you're going to hell, you know. And, all. Mm-hmm. and I can't remember the whole sermon because, you know, it's been a long time. But yeah. that's, you know, the basic of what he said. That classic hellfire mm-hmm. and brimstone right. kind of thing. Mm-hmm. What was your return to the church like? Because I know that you are. Uh, really, I haven't come back yet. Mm-hmm. I'm really considering going back to my mother's home church, which is by the farm uh-huh. uh, in Frankenmuth. Mm-hmm. Um, I just gave a talk uh, at a different church, and um, they, they, the, the people that go there, they just came up to me afterwards and said, you're more than welcome at our church.
My mother said she loved me, yeah. but I don't believe she ever accepted me as who I am. And this is, you're talking about when you came out to your mother. Right. Mm -hmm. What kind of led to that, and what was that experience like? Uh, well, I probably wouldn't have done it this particular way, but one of my exes said she was going to tell my parents as a way of, I don't know, getting back to me or whatever. And uh, so I just, you know, instead of my parents hearing it from somebody else, I, uh, I went and, uh, and I told them. And um, basically, that's that's that was it. Yeah. My father walked out the back door, and we never discussed it again. Ever. Ever. And my mother said she loved me, but I don't believe that she ever accepted who I was. Did do you believe that she thought that being gay was even a thing? Ah. Uh, I think she 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 knew what being gay was, mm -hmm. but I think religion had a lot to to do with that. Sure. Uh, her uh, because you know they both my parents were very very religious. Mm -hmm. um, basically, that's uh, what that was. It it still bothers me to this day that I don't believe uh, you know she accepted who I was. Even though she always told me she loved me, mm -hmm. I think there's a a big difference between being loved and accepted yeah. for who you are. And uh, so, absolutely, and something that I talk about because I work in customer service mm -hmm. is that everybody wants to be seen. Mm. Everybody wants to be heard, and I think. When somebody says to you, um, I love you, but I don't accept that part of your life, mm -hmm. you're not being seen. You're not being heard. Um, and I understand how difficult that can be. What was it like coming out to your siblings, if you have come out to your siblings? I never really did. Did they? Um, but they my, know. My mother said, you know, don't, don't tell anybody, you know, and all that. And but she went and I believe she called my sister immediately. Uh, I never talked to my sister about it, but she was, I don't believe she's not accepting either. Sure. And I don't believe my brother was either. Mm -hmm. um, we were year, four years apart with my brother, and when he went away from college, I was just kind of girl, growing up, going into high school. Yep. And then when he he graduated, you know he. Went to California for a job, you know, so we weren't that close. Sure. But I don't believe he, he accepted the, the fact that I was gay either. Um, did that change over time? Or no. did that stay? No, it's my, my brother's gone now, but uh, I, I believe I don't talk to my sister anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, I took my mother and my sister to a PFLAG meeting once. Yes. And all the way home, uh, I was ridiculed, and and basically, uh, my sister says, "I don't understand why what those people do." And I says, "You're talking about me. I'm one of those people, mm -hmm. you know." Uh, and that was the last time that I asked my mother and my sister to go to a P flag meeting with me because I was I felt good when I left the meeting, and by the time I got home, I was, you know. Yeah. I mean, um, my mother always said, don't talk about it. Don't tell anybody. Um, and that was, they didn't talk about anything. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a young, you know, the old-fashioned Germans. They don't uh, show no emotion. Uh -uh. Oh, yeah. So it. Uh, that Midwestern silence. Mm-hmm. Don't right. talk about it. It'll mm -hmm. just go away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's common a lot. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it's sad because even when my brother got a divorce, my sis, my ma says, "Well, don't tell nobody." You know, like he's the only person in the world that's ever gotten a divorce. You know, <laughs> and, and I'm going, "Well, well, he, you know, he was the first one in all of our family." You know, to 
get a divorce. Yeah. I says, so what? I says, everybody's getting divorces all the time. Uh-huh. What difference does it make? You know, but that's just how they were. Uh, you just didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. And to backtrack a little bit, I know that in high school and in your early days of college, you dated men. Yeah, I didn't go to college, but I did date oh, men. I thought, no, I thought you. <laughs> no, I didn't I'm go to college. <laughs> what was? I barely made it through high school. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were, what was that experience like? You're like, oh, I'm just gonna date this guy because it's what I'm supposed to do. Well, yeah, that's kind of the way it is. You know mm-hmm. that that's what it was. It just never felt right, though. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. It. Uh, and if it seemed to get too. Close. Yep. I would back away. Yep. Um, so that that's all that one. <laughs> sure. And then how did you, what was it like taking the steps to have a romantic relationship with another woman for the first time? Uh, that was kind of scary. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it was uh, somebody that I worked with. And you never talk about it. You don't, um, you can't just... At least I thought you couldn't come right out and say, are you, you know, and it it just seemed to happen one time, you know, so. What signals let you know that she might be interested in you? How did you, Uh, how did that moment? Well, we started hanging around a lot Uh together and doing things. What kind of stuff would you do? Uh, Well, they had a cabin up north and uh, we'd go up snowmobiling and, uh, water skiing and you know different things like that, and it just led to a relationship. Yeah, it was it was scary that day. <laughs> scary, and then um, at least I know in my personal experience, it's super scary, but it's also super exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite things you ever told me about your life was how you got to know the um, Bavarian parade queen of Frankenmuth. <laughs> what was that like? Um, First of all, can you I just... I worked with this person. You worked with this person? This was the person I worked with, yeah. Okay. And what and is... Can you describe this? What does this person look like? Not the typical Bavarian queen, I would say. What's the typical Bavarian queen? She looked more like you. <laughs> Pat, are you calling me large? <laughs> she was big bone. Let's she, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I use, too. I say I'm just big boned. Yeah. I just got to fill it out. <laughs> that, that's what my, my, my joke, my sister uh, said. I don't know how she ever got to be a very queen. There must have been something going on, you know. And what are the responsibilities of the Bavarian queen? Uh, I believe uh, she had to go to all the different parades and, you know, represent Frankenmuth. Yep, be in the parade, sit on the float. Mm-hmm. And it's a pageant thing, right? She won a pageant. Uh, I don't know. I, I This all happened before I met her. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you met her at work. Yep. Is this the same water ski and snowmobiling? Mm-hmm. Okay. My first, yeah. Yes. So you met her at work. She's the Bavarian queen. Um, I didn't know that in the beginning. but <laughs> <laughs> It's one of those added pluses because, at the end. Because, you know, the picture just didn't match, match the Bavarian queen stereotype. Sure. Yeah. She was a little bit more outdoorsy. Oh, yeah. She was a burly mm-hmm. Bavarian queen. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you guys spent time snowmobiling. Mm-hmm. Water skiing. Yeah, we went out to the movies, you know, and stuff like that. That was uh, all I did was work. Then, you know, I worked all I could. So. Sure. And where were you working at that time? Uh GM. You're working at GM. Mm-hmm. And now, is this the same woman who then said, "Hey, I'm going to tell your parents." Yes. Uh, what did that feel like when you heard that from her? Um, uh, that hurt. Yeah. That hurt a lot. Um. I probably wasn't ready to tell my parents yet. I think they knew something was going on because, sure. hey, you know, she was always around, you know. Mm-hmm. And my mom always invited my girlfriends to eat, you know, if dinners, you know, Easter, Christmas, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, that, that hurt. Uh, um, and I think that 
relationship. Um, affected me with every relationship that I have had since. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of hard to explain that, but um, I can't say it was abusive, but um, uh, financially it was not good. And I think as gay people, because... We don't see ourselves, or up until now at least, we don't see ourselves in movies. Mm -hmm. We don't see happy gay relationships in our lives. We don't learn about it from our parents. So that first kind of relationship you have, mm -hmm. that's your first and only experience with what it's like to be loved by somebody that you love. Right. And then I and, feel it. And then get the X, you know. Yeah, um, and then... You know, I... Um, <laughs> Yeah, it uh, it really hurt. It it hurt me for a long time. Sure. Did you when she said I'm going to out you to your parents? Did you for a second think to yourself, well, I'm going to tell your parents? I didn't think that. I wouldn't care. You know, sure. I don't care if they didn't. You know, yeah. I really didn't like her parents. <laughs> <laughs> the Bavarian king and queen. <laughs> You said you were working at GM at that time, mm -hmm. and this is the about seventies. This is the seventies. Mm -hmm. Set the scene of what it's like uh, uh, an average day working at GM in the seventies. Oh, sure, hell. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Can I say that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I, um, it was it was interesting because after high school, I only had. Uh, Two jobs, I think. One was at a uh, a food processor where I had to sort through the not lamp, llama lamp. Oh, llama, what are those beans? Lima beans. Lima beans. Lima beans. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. Um, I had a stroke, so my tongue gets twisted. Sure. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get the words out. <laughs> and. Um, and corn, I, I would push the, the corn down to the chutes, and the ladies would put it in the husker, and, you know, and they'd cut the corn, you know, all that. And then I worked at a, uh, a furniture company uh, making furniture for cabinets for TVs and that. Mm -hmm. And I was on strike there. I was a teamster. Hey. And I went from that, and I put, I had my application in, and they called me from so I went off a strike picket line to GM to work. So ah. I, I really only had three jobs my whole life, so that's not too bad. And I don't mean to be ignorant. I mm. don't know much about, like, did oh. you work on the line? Oh, And what yes. exactly does that mean for other people? I was mostly uh, on assembly lines. Mm -hmm. My first job, I'm going to tell you, uh, <laughs> you know, naive you know, get in there, and they put you with three other people on a round circle thing that goes around in a circle. And here, you put this part here and that part here, and that's it, you know. Yeah. And you're doing this. Well, a couple hours into it, I says, uh, what do you call these things? And the guy across from me says, they're donkey dicks. <laughs> And so I and I says okay, and I just keep working. Yeah. Oh, great! I'm gonna. You know, like he was gonna shock me. You know. Yeah. I've been on a farm. I know. Yeah. And but honestly, that's exactly what it looked like. <laughs> it was a pot on the end with a long shaft. <laughs> 
And the guys, after, when we went on break, they they all says, hey, you're okay. You know, you didn't even get a red face. And they said they waited two hours for me to ask what I was making. Yeah. So they could say that to me. <laughs> and after I didn't bother me, you know, they just, yeah. then I was one of the guys, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but that's honestly what. It was called in the plant. I mean, it had a number. <laughs> it, I hope so. <laughs> it had a number and everything, but uh, but that's what everybody called it in the shop. You had I learned my first shop talk that day, the first day of work, you know. And, and that was was that them setting the tone for how what the work environment's like. Ah, uh, yes. Basically, it was just mundane, doing the same thing day after day after day after day. Um, you know, if if the pay wasn't there, I wouldn't still be there. Sure. When you were working at GM, that's when you first met Tammy. Yeah. What was that like? Um, well, I got transferred. Set the scene for us. Well, I was working at at one plant. There were seven of them over there at the time. And, and, uh, um, you know, with cutbacks and all that, you get transferred to one plant to another, and I ended up at, at another plant and um, working on the assembly line right next to the guy I was working at at the other plant. Mm-hmm. In fact, they moved the whole line to another plant. That's, you know, what they do. And um, I was, uh, you know, the guy says, hey, you know, uh, she's uh, trans." Gender, you know, and I go, oh. Okay. But did they use those words? Uh, no. Yep. Um, it's you ain't got to say it. Okay, I I prefer not. To. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I ran into her in the locker room. Did you know what that meant? When oh they yes. Said, oh yeah. yes. Oh yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm sorry to interrupt you. You said you were you came into the locker room and. Yeah, well, her locker was, you know, when you leave, everybody's in the locker room changing your shoes because I never took my stinky shoes home, you know, with all the oil and gook all yeah. over them. And, uh, you know, we just got to talking, and basically we became friends. That was it. Um, uh, we had a lot in common. We we went on vacations together. I'm a birder. Um, got her into birding, mm-hmm. and uh, I used to go to all the campouts in Michigan by myself, and um, and then she started co- going to the campouts with me, and we enjoyed that, and we'd go on vacations, and and what really brought you guys together was you had common things in common. Yeah, well, like, you know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um. I don't remember if I even said, well, you know, the guys told me, you know, hey, it doesn't bother me, you know, one way or the other. And um, so I don't, uh, it was hard for her to talk about it. So I didn't push it. If she wanted to, fine, you know, it was okay. But, hey, as far as I was concerned, we were just friends, you know. Yeah. Um, And uh, so we did things together. And it really was as simple as that for you. It was as we have things in common. Mm Mm-hmm. We like yeah. each other. That was it. You yeah. didn't have any other questions? No, nothing else bothered me. I think that's incredible. No. Because you, you see in the news, you see online, mm-hmm. all these people are, are struggling right. with how to conceive of right. what a transgender person is and, and what they aren't. Right. And she had to leave work, take a leave of absence from GM, and transitioned, mm-hmm. and then came back to work. Now, that took, to me, that took so much courage yes. from her to come back to work yeah. as a woman um, and get ridiculed mm-hmm. at work. Uh, she was an electrician, and... Nobody else would work with her. That sometimes they always work in teams mm-hmm. because of the electrical. You know, um, she always worked by herself. She said nobody wanted to work with her. Um, so it was, um, and she usually worked uh, second shift. Um, but yeah, she she never 
complain or anything. She was she did not ever regret doing what she did. And I think what's especially amazing, this is the same place where, you know, these men walked up to you and said, This car part's called a donkey. Yeah. The first the first after the first three hours, yeah, this is what they so you can imagine what she had to put up with. Mm-hmm. From, uh, you know, and, and at one point I was um, cut back to a janitor there. That's how close. I, I, I never was laid off at, at any of these. I just hit everything perfect, mm-hmm. it seems like. When they went on strike, I was working on Chrysler products. And so I never got, I, hadn't, I couldn't go on strike. I had to, we had to make the Chrysler products, mm-hmm. you know. So I never, you know, um, but... For her to to be there that long and put up with all that, it's it the courage that she has is she was one of the first ones in Michigan. Uh, she went all over the country. She told me to talk to senators and representatives to get the laws changed so she could get her driver's license and everything changed. Um, but yet she was very shy and quiet. And for her to do all that, you know, I mean, she had such a drive to get it done right. Um, but she was, she was shy, quiet, and very private. Mm -hmm. What do you know about the process it took for her to get that surgery? Well, um, I'm still going through her personal papers. Mm Mm-hmm. I have found um, letters from her doctors, mm-hmm. and it's it's hard to read some of them. Absolutely. Um, uh, they um, basically said, you know, as far as they were concerned, she was a female. And I guess these were letters to the state or whoever, you know, so she could get uh, her driver's license and that changed um it you know i just don't think i could have ever done what she did i cannot imagine no Mm -mm. Um, and her parents were not accepting either of this you know i mean it's completely different than my case Uh, but her dad came around i mean he uh he was super um towards the end even after he got a bit of dementia, mm-hmm. um, and he's, you know, he still left her in his will, which she did not, you know, think would ever happen. So, um, yeah, it's, I just can't imagine what she had to go through. No, I cannot fathom yeah, it. Yeah, I can't either. Cannot be imagined. Mm-hmm. Um. And now I know that in some states, in some situations, a transgendered person has to get some sort of documentation or a letter from a psychologist. Oh, yeah. She had to go to I don't know how many doctors. Mm -hmm. And that's one reason why she found PFLAG for me. Um, And she come, but she didn't like to because we always sit in a circle. And she says it reminded me of her of so many of her therapy sessions mm-hmm. of sitting around in a circle with a bunch of other people, you know, um, that she couldn't handle that. It reminded her of way back, you yeah. know, what she all had to go through, you know, to get all the doctor's permission, you know, to even go to a doctor to um, to have the surgery. Mm-hmm. And I, I, she had it in New York. Um Someplace I'm not, you know, that's where the papers I found came from. And through Tammy, did you, is, was there a transgender community at that time? I don't think so. Yeah. No. Did no. Tammy have other friends who were transgender or? Yes. Uh, she had uh, uh, another girl, uh, Sharon. Uh, we still talk at least once a month mm-hmm. that, uh, they roomed. She worked for Chrysler, by the way, and um, um, she uh, they they roomed together for quite a while. I think 
I don't know if it was before or after, you know, their surgeries, but uh, um, other than those two, until I went to PFLAG, that's the only two that I knew of for a long time. Um, you know, back in the 70s, that wasn't, you never heard about transgender people that yeah. much. And when, so you guys became neighbors. Mm-hmm. You guys shared a farm, or no, no, it, you just know, land. I, I bought ten acres, and she bought ten acres. I, you know, I wanted a farm. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted a big garden and all that stuff, oh, you yeah. know. And I mean, and she used to help her father with a, a lawn service, so she hated, hated. <laughs> I don't know why she wanted to to move out there. Well, we both lived in the trailer parks, hated that, and so I, you know, moved out in the country in the middle of a ten acre. So hopefully, and um, so now I have 20 acres, so it's uh, to take care of. story that I think is really important um, and it's about when Tammy was in the hospital mm -hmm. and yes. her family showed up. Yeah well before she was sick for a week um, I always take her her mail and uh, get her any food she wanted. Finally I said you're not getting any better I'm calling the ambulance Yep. and um, so the ambulance come and, and took her and when I showed up at the emergency room, um, you know, they had monitors on her. They said it was her heart. And um, so they finally found her a room, and the next day I was up there, and all of a sudden she started getting these chills. And um, she was on the heart wing or whatever they call mm -hmm. that with all those monitors so they can check her on her. And the nurses come in and they said, well, you know, she's going to have a heart attack. we got to take her up to ICU. And I go, well, I don't know if she wants. Tammy, do you want me to call your parent, your um, family, mm -hmm. your sister? And she says, no. And uh, I guess I didn't realize, you know, what that meant when they said they got to take her to ICU, mm -hmm. you know, or she's going to have a heart attack. They didn't say that she was going to die. They just said, you know, she's going to have a heart attack, you know. So I said, well, okay. And they'll, you know, figure it out and everything will be okay. Well, um, they uh, couldn't help her anymore. So um, they um, said I had to let her go. And I called her sister, which... She told me not to, but I thought that was the right thing to do. And um, her sister flies in from California, uh, Hawaii, I'm sorry, from Hawaii. And um, I believe her sister's husband was already here taking care of the father's house. And um, the first thing out of his mouth was, who's in charge of her money? Um, so that was three days of hell, fighting them off and trying to decide what to do. Yep. Um, she wanted her body donated to science, but the people at the ICU were not very nice, I thought. Um, I don't believe they understood they knew that she was transgender but i don't believe they liked it yeah and when i told them she's giving her body to science 
I want this arranged. Mm -hmm. And they said they called, but nobody would take her, which I think is a bunch of crap. Yeah. Um, they said, well, her, her organs are too bad. I says, well, that's not why she's donating her body. Um, but they wouldn't do it. And so um, that wasn't in the, the will or anything. So when her, her sister had to sign a paper to uh, have her cremated, and the only reason she would sign the paper if I would let them in the room when she died. Mm -hmm. And her sister got her phone out and started taking pictures of her. And even the chaplain told her not to. And that bothered me, something yeah. terrible. Um, why would you want pictures of your sister with all this medical equipment on her um, before she yeah. dies? You know, it just didn't. I don't understand those people, but I finally had to, before all this happened, I had to ban them from coming in because the only thing he would say was, who's in charge of her money? And it got to the point where the security people at the hospital even walked me to my car at night because he would sit out in the parking lot. You know, and this isn't the dad. This is the brother-in-law. This is the brother-in-law. This is some, this is some random man. Yeah, yeah. And the first day in ICU, he was up there before I got there in the morning, and they told him everything. And he calls me up before I even leave my house to go up there, and I always went up there early in the morning. Mm -hmm. And telling me that we got to pull the plug on her. And that was the exact words. Um, and when I get there, the nurses said, well, who was that guy? Mm -hmm. I said, that is her brother-in-law. He has no right for anything. I was on her medical Um. Medi power of whatever. I was her power of attorney. Yeah. I was her medical attorney, everything. And that has been at that hospital for years. But they made me go home, go through my safe, and find all those papers and bring them back up there. And I threw them at those people in ICU. That pissed me off royalty because for years, those, everything that, you know, we would go in, it was always in that computer. Yep. And because he was up there and they told him everything and he wants to pull the plug on her, I mean, they made me go through hell those three days. Yep. And I never got an evaluation from them. Usually the hospital sends out, because every time I was in there, they always send you an evaluation, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was waiting for it, because I was going to put on there exactly what happened. But I never got one. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they stopped doing it or what, but I mean, that really... I'm going to say pissed me off, yep. you know? I mean, none of that should have ever happened. Because all that stuff was there, but yet she made me go get all this paperwork and bring it back in to prove that I had the right to be there. Yeah. They didn't say I didn't have a right to be there, but they, they believed whatever he had told them before I got there. And that's what made me mad. Sure. And um, I did let him into her room once, and he just walked in, and he turned to me, and he says, Who's in charge of her money? I says, get the hell out of here. Yeah. You know, he didn't even look at her. You know, I mean, it, the, so anyway, that's, that was, 
besides losing her as a friend. Um, it was hell for those three days. And what have they, what have communication with them been like since? I have absolutely no communication with them at all. Fuck them. Yeah. And I do know that they tried to get her, her GM savings. Um, yeah, I mean, because <laughs> when I called, you know, several months, the lawyers kept telling me, well, you know, you got to do this, too. You know, I couldn't do everything right away, you know. Uh, and then they tell me, well, we don't know who it belongs to. So you knew dang well somebody else has been trying to get it, you know. I mean, it was, you know, but that's. And then going through her papers. Mm hmm I found receipts after receipts after receipts. She was sending these two people. She's a professor in Hawaii. Her sister. Her sister. Her brother-in-law is a retired army guy. And she is sending them 500 bucks here, 750 here, sometimes twice a week. Money. I says, what? She, you know, I knew she was sending them money when she was still alive, but mm -hmm. I didn't know how much until yeah. I went through some of her records. I mean, they were just using her for, I mean, I just, you know, it just made me sick because I went through the same thing with when my mother passed away, too. Mm -hmm. it, uh, that's why I don't have any communication with my sister. Mm -hmm. um, the greed of People, when somebody dies, is I mean, it's just terrible. Well, I think something about what you've been talking about that I, I, I think should be emphasized is that regardless of how these people treated you, mm -hmm. regardless of how these people treated Tammy, you let them into the hospital room still. Yeah. Tammy still sent them money. Mm -hmm. Um. And I think it takes a certain kind of bravery to uh, to be kind to people who have been cruel to you. Mm -hmm. That's a different kind of bravery. Yeah, yeah. So this friend that I have that that she had mine now friend of mine mm -hmm. in, in Oregon, I told her you know the problems that we had because she wanted to donate her body too mm -hmm. in Oregon. This is a transgender friend of yes. Tammy. Okay. Yeah. Well, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, as you said, now it's your friend. Yeah, so she went and took care of all that. Be right now. She the next time we talk, she says, "I've already contacted the hospital, and they know the situation." And she says, "I'm taken care of." She said, <laughs> and so that helped, you know, her because some of her fra family is not too. <laughs> You know, I mean, some of her family, every time they come to visit, something disappears from her house, she says. So, you know, I mean, she knows. I got a couple of those family members. She knows what's going to happen, you know, when she's gone. Everything goes okay. You know, I mean, it, it's hilarious. I mean, you have to laugh about some of this stuff that people do. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it would blow your brains out, yeah. you know. Otherwise, I mean, how are you getting out of bed? Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's terrible. And I'm having neighbor problems because they stole from me. You would think out in the country, you know, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. I would, you know, sometimes I'm in my front yard and and sound carries out in the country, you know. They call me queer, you know. I mean, it. Um, I mean, I hear the queer word. Let's put it that way. I, they're not really talking to me, but they know I could hear it, you know. Um, and that sort of thing happens, you know. And then they wonder why, you know, things happen that happen. So, Pat, is this a pending court case? Uh, I've already been in jail once for turning around in their driveway. Pat, you know where I stand on this. <laughs> <laughs> You're stubborn. Um, um, I remember one thing, and this this is really all... 
are we going to get in legal trouble with these people talking about this? Hey, At any I, rate, you told me frankly, something. Frankly, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I know you don't, Pat. I know you don't. I mean, oh. you can put up with this crap for so long. You know, hey, I'm, si- I'm 74 years old. You know, how much time do I have left? I says, hey, I don't care anymore. I'm going to say what I want to say. Mm-hmm. You know, and I wasn't in the wrong because the judge threw it out. Yep. You know, I mean, I have nothing on my record. It was an experience. Uh, in fact, just last week, there was an article in a little hick rag paper. Uh, there was a sheriff, you know, article that they need a new jail. Well, I knew they needed a new jail, and I only spent a day in there <laughs> when the guy was fingerprinting me. <laughs> The wall next to the machine, there's cables coming out, like airline cables, you know, with yeah. one of those turnbuckle things that tighten up. And I says, hey, what's this all about? And he says, well, that's holding the wall up. <laughs> going, you got to be kidding me. I said, am I going to get the ceiling collapsed on me in here or what? You know? <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, it's an experience to, to go. I mean, that was on my bucket list to go to jail. At least get arrested and go to jail once, you know. Um, but I've done it. Um, Check. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it was. Uh, it even even the people there said, "God, you know these people. Who, why don't they get a life? You know, <laughs> you turn around in your driveway to get your mail, and the mailbox ain't even in front of your property." <laughs> it's crazy. Well, I remember my mom had told me that you went to jail. And then I saw you shortly thereafter, mm-hmm. and I said, Pat, if you go back over there, you're going to go back to jail. And you looked at me, and I'll never forget this. You said, well, I kind of liked it. <laughs> we had so much to talk about. Oh, I know. Me and all the I, ladies. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, I had different uh, roomies, and, and I know all the prison lingo now. And <laughs> What's some, Can you share some prison lingo with us? Oh, God. Oh, God. Now you're going to. Now that I put you on the button. Now that, yeah, you got me. Uh, It'll come to you. Uh, but uh, well, the pods, you know, I know what a pod is now, and and um, well, the first lady that was in there, I mean, they just there's no chairs, no bed, you know, there's a slab about six inches off the floor, and that's what you sit or lay on. And what were you in jail for exactly? Uh, I turned around in their driveway. But what is that? Is that trespassing? Is that? Well, that's what they said. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ooh, you're a, you're um, like a legal eagle. Uh, you know, I mean, and they also have a personal protection order against little old me because they don't like me telling them to pay me back what they stole from me. And I can't see their house from my house. They can't see mine. The only time we see each other is when they attack me at the post at the mailbox. So you go to the mailbox and these people come up and they come on running out at me with their cameras taking pictures and movies of me. I mean, they must have a a whole room with nothing but photos and pictures of me. They have cameras all over their property taking pictures of me. They knew every time I left the other driveway. They know what I do in my backyard. These people don't have a life, you know? I mean, it's... Um, Pat, you stay out of jail. Because who is it going to be who's coming down to bail you out is my in the here, I want to get this in. In the hearing, they both lied over 17 times to the court. And my I fired my attorney because he didn't defend me. He didn't question. Every time they told a lie, I gave him one of them. Uh, I hit him with my elbow, and I pointed. I had lie written on a pacer, and I pointed. To, and he never questioned anybody in rebuttal on any of that stuff. So you fired him. Yep. And then? I got a new one when I ended up in jail. Mm-hmm. And I got acquitted. <laughs> <laughs> well, the judge wanted me to plead guilty, and she was going to give me a slap on the wrist. Uh-huh. I says, no, I am not guilty. I won't do that. So the attorney went back in to see her again and come back. And my attorney says, uh, your neighbors aren't going to be too happy. Because I had gotten a manuscript of the first hearing, mm-hmm. and I found the page where he had, out in the country, 33 feet from the center of the road, really, it's yours, but it the county has control over it. 
you even have to get a permit to cut a tree down in that area, mm-hmm. which I found out after I cut down 14 trees, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I didn't know. You know? <laughs> but they didn't. He says, we understand. You couldn't see out your driveway, so you cut them down. Right. That's what I did. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, uh, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, I'm having one of those senior <laughs> <laughs> but you were you're reading the manuscript, and I'm yeah. sure you highlighted every I, one of those 17 oh, lies. I've got little tabs on every page they told yeah. a lie, you know. And I said, here, on page, you know, I think it was page 10 or 11. And he went back into the judge, and she read, and, I, okay, come on, back in the courtroom. You know, uh, you know, so I didn't even have to plead one way or the other. Yeah. She just dropped it, you know, because mm-hmm. <laughs> I was right. That had to be a good feeling. Oh yeah, <laughs> I turned around and and I, I, she hates it. My neighbor hates it when I laugh at her. She's got a problem with me laughing at her. So I turned around and went. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, and that's that on that, right? Yeah, I says, hey. So <laughs> anyway, that's um, only one little uh, short chapter in my long. Uh, Interesting life. <laughs> I was going to say in your long legal career. Well, yeah. Because I think you'd make an incredible lawyer. Well, you know, hey, if I'm right, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> if I could reach over this table and pinch you right now, I would. This questionnaire, kind of. Okay. And really, it's just kind of quick, fun questions. All right. Um, I'll try. <laughs> and I think it would be a, a fun way, because I'm going to ask everybody these questions. Um, so I think it's going to be a fun way to... I think it's going to be fun. hmm Okay. What's the biggest difference between younger and older LGBTQ folks? Oh, they're so more open. Yeah. And, uh, you mm-hmm. know, they don't care what anybody thinks or says about them anymore, I think. Well, that's yeah. because of you. And they can all look up anything they want on a computer, which I don't have. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's the one piece of advice you would give younger members of the LGBTQ community? Don't forget what the older people of the community did. Hell yeah. So because of what, you know, so you're what you have now, yep. you know. It didn't just pop out of the ground. Right, right. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you feel about younger people using the word queer? Uh, that, I realize that's what they're doing now. I gave one of my cousins our PFLAG literature, and it's got that word queer in there. Mm-hmm. And right away she says, well, I don't like that. I, don't, I think that's a detor- bad word. Yep. And I says, well, that's what the younger generation is using now. I said, they don't consider it queer. Now, when my neighbor says queer to me, that I don't like, you know. But if the younger generation use it, you know, in there, I said, that's, you know, doesn't bother me. And you're able to see there's a difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a difference in how it's used. Um, Who was a gay icon for you growing up? Martina. Um, Tennis. Tennis. Yes. Hell yeah. Um, What stereotypes about LGBTQ folks bother you the most? That there's so much prejudice in our own community. That Uh, really upsets me. I get the lesbian connection, and I'm just finishing up the last one. And in all the ads and, you know, what things to do and all that, they put uh, women born women, mm-hmm. and that really 
I can't understand. We, you know, the community gets discriminated against. So why should we in the community discriminate against ourselves? Uh, Tammy and I never went to the Michigan Women's Music Festival because of that fact. Mm -hmm. I had, I told her, I said, well, she wouldn't go anyway. But I said, you know, I'll go if you want to go. Yeah. You know, who could tell, you know? And and she says, no, I don't want to go. And uh, um, I think that's why it went defunct. Sure. And now they're trying to get it back together. And I am really upset because we went to, we always went to the National in Madison, Wisconsin. And at the year after the Michigan closed, there was a lot of them there and during one of the concerts that night these women got up on the dance floor and they started stripping and there was couples with kids there supporting a relative or somebody that was in the band and mm -hmm. all these people were getting up and leaving because well I was on one side of the room and these people were on the other. I didn't see it until the announcer come up after that uh mm -hmm. and said, Hey, we're not at you know, and that really turned me off to those people. That because they were so ignorant, I thought. Because you're not in a woods, you know what's around. I mean, there was people, I mean, there were, in fact, just in front of us, there was a family. They got up and left because I think the father's seen it. He didn't want his kids to see that. I just don't understand why they would even do that in a public place like that. And if I understand what you're saying right, the hypocrisy is... They're going to act all wild, stripping all, acting all crazy, mm -hmm. but then say that Tammy can't come. Yeah. Because Tammy's not. That doesn't make sense to me. I, so I kind of have a, you know, I'm, if it, if I'm prejudiced, I'm sorry, I'm, I just said I'm prejudiced <laughs> against them. <laughs> but I think. I know what you're saying. I, I, I really think. You know, the prejudice inside the, our own community is bad, but then I just said that, you know. Mm -hmm. But I just don't think that was the right thing for them to, people to be doing in a public place like that. Not at all. I mean, that's how we get these bad reputations. Have you ever used a dating site or No, app? you know, because <laughs> I don't have a computer. <laughs> um, who was your first celebrity crush? Martina. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your best Halloween costume? I never dressed up. Oh, shame. No. What's the best age? Well, it used to be 45, but uh, about 45. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, what's your favorite fast food? Oh, wow. I'm not really a fast food person. Um. Oh, my God. Taco Bell. Yeah. Taco mm -hmm. Bell. Um, you get to have dinner with three people, alive or dead. Who are they? Oh, Martina, uh, Billie Jean King, and uh, oh, I, there was a comedian. I can't remember what her name is now. I used to go see her all the time at her shows. Oh, I can't remember it. <laughs> and I have all her albums and everything. I'm sorry, I'm having one of those senior. Um. <laughs> What's a piece of advice you would give to 20-year-old you? Uh, get an education. What part of aging has bothered you the most? Uh, the last two years because my, my health is going down. <laughs> what part of aging has brought you the most joy? Uh, I think I understand things better than I did when I was younger. Yeah. I, uh, you know, unfortunately it's, it's not good, but <laughs> you know, I, I think I, I understand people a lot better and I think I'm, I'm more patient too now, mm. more patient with people. What would you bring to a potluck dinner? I like my rice and pork with, um, 
Uh, I put in uh, cream of celery soup, mm -hmm. and it's a casserole type oh, yeah. thing. I, I enjoyed making that. If you could ask me any question, what would it be? Mm. Oh, my word. You should have asked me this a long time ago so I could have thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard question. Oh, my word. Um are you enjoying this job? Let's put it that way. I heard you didn't. I didn't enjoy it? You didn't enjoy <laughs> teaching. I'm oh. sorry. No, this is the best job I've ever had in my life. Oh, okay. The fact that we're sitting here doing this right now uh -huh. is so incredible to me. Yeah. I can't believe, oh, I'm saying this on a recording. I can't believe I'm being paid to do this. Uh -huh. It is unbelievable to that, me. That, to me, is the best thing anybody could feel about their job. Like, see, mine... I was there because of the money. Yep. I hated going in there every day. I hated the, the idiots I had to work with. Mm -hmm. um, but I stuck it out just, just for the money and the pension, yeah. uh, basically. Um, yeah, like I say, I would have loved to work at Dow for 40 years instead of the 33 I already did, you know. Making ears and chins and boobs. Yep, yep. I didn't get to make the boobs, Ugh. but I did get... Rejects. I still have them packed someplace. They're probably all stuck together by now and yeah. dried up. You know, they're, they're melted. <laughs> yeah, they're probably all. <laughs> I don't know where they're at, but I, I, <laughs> well, Pat, I, I, I played with them for a while, but you know. <laughs> Pat, I really, I, I, I really can't thank you enough. Oh. Um, uh, just thank you so much. Well, this, this is uh, this was nice. I I enjoyed it. Your your mother has really got me to open up. Good for all these TED talks she signs me up for. <laughs> <laughs> but Pat, you like it, um, or do you? I'm getting. You know, I was really kind of leery at first. You know, but the okay. more I I mean, I've had people come up to me that were at some of the first ones I did at the last, in fact, that last one at the church just a couple yep. of weeks ago, a girl, a lady came up to me and, and told me, you know, that she had heard me before and she said, and she really appreciated me talking, you know, and, and that, in fact, one of the girls said that she went to Redeemer, too. Sure. The church, you know, the school that I went to, she was Catholic, but her, you know, I says, oh, your parents had to pay to send you there, did she? And she says, yeah, we, you know, they didn't belong to the church, so you could pay to have your kid go there, you know, because mm -hmm. they wanted her to have a better education. And um, and I, and so she came up to me and said, yeah, she went to Redeemer, too. So I thought that was, that was interesting. And I think what we did today, what you did today, Hopefully that will have the same effect. Yeah, that that's why I'm I'm doing everything your your mom has me to do <laughs> because <laughs> the Shaler Gorski clan we just push people into you shit. keep yeah. pushing huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. I think mm -hmm. um, we're all just better people for for being able to know you. So well, thank you so well, much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> that. This has been a production of Ann Arbor District Library. For more podcasts, visit aadl.org slash podcasts.